Uh, you had a question. Well, I think this one asked the same question in a different way, but I was just saying if we wipe out the US and China after the world war, and we isolate, or isolate ourselves from trading with the US and China, Mm. This is really a, a time, I think you were talking about corporate strategy, global corporate strategy. Mm -hmm. So this is really a time to think about domestic strategy, mm. for governments to think about how to, be, what can they do in terms of isolating themselves and being vulnerable to mm. uh, what's going on externally. So I wanted to just ask the same question in a different way, ah. but thank you. But give a different answer. Well, I would say. <laughs> Yes, absolutely. You're, you know, it, one of the things that happen when the global environment is disruptive, then what can you do to be more competitive is you must have your domestic house in order. You have got to do the kinds of things domestically that encourage businesses to look at locating business in your country. So that means you cannot have backwards looking policies on digital. <laughs> you cannot have disastrous policies on e-commerce. India. <laughs> you cannot have really complicated policies on hiring, firing staff because it means it's very difficult for you to be there. To locate a business, to, to operate cross-border, to, I mean, you can just go down the list and then you say, well, why are firms not looking at India? Because <coughs> They can't do payments because they can't move data, because they can't figure out what the rules are in multi, multi, what, what is the multi, what's the retail, multi, whatever it is, retail. Multi channel, channel. Single multi -channel, channel. Multi -brand multi branch channel. retail and omni channel retail, not, ex not allowed. And even if it was allowed, which it was, suddenly not allowed, like overnight, boom, all of a sudden, $6 billion in investment for some companies overnight gone. So this is not helpful. <laughs> if you want to attract inbound investment and you want to make yourself a destination for companies that are reshuffling supply chains, you must have your own domestic house in order. Very good. Thank you. <laughs> yes, uh, over there. Tell her. Kindly introduce yourself. Uh, Hi, my name is Tyagish. I'm an investment banker. I had a couple of questions for um, Mr. Krishnan and one for Kimberly. Uh, Mr. Krishnan, based on your several interactions with corporate houses, with corporate honchos and a few, uh, A, how seriously do you think they even consider evaluating the impact or the implications and the outcomes of these trade wars and, and all the allied stuff that happens? Are they serious about it at all, or do they take a cavalier approach to saying, let's see what happens, and then we'll take a call because we are used to readjustment anyway? Is that what they're saying? Uh, the second question is, is uh, leading from that. Uh, if so, how many do you think, as a percentage, have actually acted on it or have geared themselves to go out and face the implications? And what are the typical steps they take to gear themselves up for? Uh, those are the two questions I have for you. Uh, Kimberly, to uh, again, a quiz in retort, maybe. Uh, where do you think we are in, in, in terms of uh, the four scenarios we, you painted? Uh, where do you think, personally, we are? And I base it upon the benefit you have, the advantage you have day-to-day uh, -day of interacting with a bunch of intellectuals who talk to you about it. And B, over the next four to five years, where do you think we'll head to as a scenario? And why? Raymond? Yeah. Well, um, let me give you an example. I had a committee meeting or a board meeting of this association that I sit on. And on the day of the meeting, this global supply chain leader for this company, it's a shoe company. They're supposed to have a very integrated supply chain. Um, very famous brand. If I said the brand, you know who it was. So he was supposed to attend the meeting, and then two hours before the meeting, he said, look, uh, you know, I can't attend the meeting because Trump's tariffs on <coughs> trade are now impacting our shoes. This was, what, three or four weeks ago? Yeah? So, um, and I said to him, hey, Scott, you know, um, we were WhatsApping each other, and I said, don't you think this is something that you should have looked at or considered and had a contingency plan in place? Um, before it happened, it, uh, you, you should have a contingency plan in place because there was a lot of um, talk about it happening, about the escalation. And he says, yeah, but you know, if you... No, we didn't. The short answer is no, we did not. So how many supply chains or how many um, organizations are actually looking at or evaluating these scenarios? The, the simple reason is not that ma The simple answer is not that many. Um, but what we are seeing in the last two, three months, um, we at the Asian Trade Center, we've been busier than ever 
because we've got all these clients who previously were not planning on doing anything, uh, now finally faced with the impacts of this, and they're wondering, hey, how do we reevaluate our supply chain? So we've had more um, inquiries, if you like, in the last 60 days than we've had in the last two years. So people are knocking down our doors. But the long and short answer is not many are evaluating. And if I had to put a percentage to it, um, I would say even 10 or 15 percent. And I was talking to large, um, and talking about large multinationals here. And the, the, the reasons range from, from the number of reasons for this. Um, some people will say, look, I'm so bus busy um, working on my day-to-day -day business. I just have to solve what's in front of me right now. I don't have time to evaluate a what-if scenario. Um, many people did not think, I for one did not think that the trade war would escalate to this, the, the way it is now, the, the situation that it is now. So I don't have time. Um, we didn't think that it was going to happen. Um, but even if it did happen, there's so many other things that could happen in our business, not just the trade war. So we solve problems as we encounter them rather than plan proactively. Um, we had a bunch of clients with one of the three largest um, logistics companies in the world, courier companies. Um, and we were talking about Brexit. So, and this was in Hong Kong um, three or four weeks ago. And this company that relies a lot on imports from the EU, and it's a British company operating in Hong Kong, but um, sourcing a lot from the EU, said, oh, you know, we're in real trouble because with Brexit happening, um, our whole value chain or supply chain is going to be, going to be disrupted. Um, but this is a multi-million dollar business, British, um, operating in Hong Kong, sourcing from Europe, who doesn't have a contingency plan in place because they're, they're saying, I'm not sure what the contingency plan should look like. And Brexit was supposed to happen, was supposed to have happened, you know. Yeah. And this was just three or four weeks ago. And they said, no, we still haven't planned for what that contingency would be. So do they evaluate? Very few do. Um, and there's a whole different bunch of reasons why they don't. Kimberly? Thank you for the question. Um, good food for thought. I found myself somewhat vacillating between um, these, this technological disruption and competing coalitions, which makes no sense because <laughs> this one is obviously high ease of trade and this one is low ease of trade and they're completely the opposite. But I think, I, I, I think there's some method to my madness. Overall, I would say right now I'm team competing coalitions. So I think we are probably already starting to live in a world. I mean, global value chains are already regional. That's a story we've known for the past two decades. Um, I, I think we are possibly moving towards that fortress-like regional bo blocks with larger economies exerting their power, influence, and standards um, on those around them. We saw that very clearly with USMCA. Um, we'll probably start to see that in this region as well. CPTPP is, was much less a trade negotiation than it was a, a, a geopolitical negotiation. And certainly the conclusion of it without the US was also a strong <coughs> message. Um, where we will go in five to 10 years, I think that's where the bifurcation depends on where you sit and what type of company you are or what type of country you are, um, possibly also the choices you make. Um, I think for some countries, they'll continue to live in the competing coalition space. Um, but then there may be some companies, less so on countries, but some companies may find themselves in the technological disruption where they may have high ease to trade, but massive uncertainties on a daily basis. Those will be the larger companies. Um, so it will probably be, for example, a payment service supplier. They'll continue to supply payments globally. That's a service they <coughs> offer worldwide. However, they'll probably encounter uh, challenge or have to deal with threats left, right, and center to their business model. Um, th again, in that world, I see SMEs as particularly disadvantaged. So they'll, they're probably more stuck in the competing coalitions bucket and for them trade will be regional or even trade will be with one trading partner at most so this story of SMEs using e-commerce platforms to trade to the world I think unless we move more up to the sort of multi or back to a multilateral norms based system SMEs cannot cope with trade wars they cannot cope with that kind of uncertainty so I think unfortunately it's 
there, again, we go back to trade, maybe not benefiting all, but benefiting just the larger players, sadly. But I hope that we make some moves that we don't end up in that situation. Very realistic assessment, both from Raymond and Kimberly. Maybe, maybe just to add something to that and maybe um, to spark some debate. Um, I, I was noticing the frown of one of my colleagues in the audience when we said that SMEs would not be able to compete um, with the trade war. Um, we have a slightly deferring opinion. Um, because SMEs are smaller, they are more nimble, and because there is this access to technology today, um, it's actually an opportunity rather than a... It could be an opportunity rather than um, a negative impact of having these sort of disruptions. Because large organisations that have worked in, you know, 15,000, 20,000 employees, to steer the ship in a different direction, to take advantage of a situation, is very, very challenging. Um, especially if you work for an American organization, because everyone has an opinion about what should be done, but nobody actually wants to be responsible for it. Um, but with an SME, you've got that nimbleness, you've got that power, the, the, the internet and technologies that exist today. It's a great leveler. Um, so you have that flexibility. So actually, out of that could become STEM opportunities rather than actually making it difficult for SMEs to compete. Just an opinion. Sure. You started a debate. So uh, I think I agree with you. If we look really forward forward um, on something like 5G, and there we're starting to see this case of the standards really could diverge. So the, the body that, um, that regulates uh, the standards for 5G, 3GPP, has, is already challenged by this, the, the US position of Huawei. Huawei is very involved with that body. Um, so it might lead the US to pull out of that body, which would then mean that we would probably have a world where we have two 5G standards, which would then result in um, app and software development around two fronts, which the consequences then on for the digital economy would mean that you're operating in two bifurcated systems, which if, if it's two systems, then maybe that's not so bad, and maybe you just then pick your market and you... But then I guess the, the question is, 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 that, is that feasible and how does that play out? But, yeah. Sure. I mean, I have uh, several comments on that as well. Uh, you know, like you said, uh, technology is a great opportunity. Yes, in a big picture sense it is. But uh, I've read Richard Baldwin, you may have read him also, he's saying that uh, as much as technology flows from rich countries to emerging economies, they made sure that access to technology is straight-jacketed within that firm. It doesn't flow outside of the firm. Of course, there are countries uh, which have forced technology transfer, but that's not easy. And again, uh, to Kimberly's point about this balkanization of the internet and uh, what it might do uh, to the world, whether it will increase efficiency, erode efficiency, it will force every country to take a view. We've got to be in the China block or the US block. You know, it's very difficult, uh, real world practical questions. Other questions, comments? Can I, can I just say on the small sure. business? So we also run at the Asian Trade Center, we also run the Asian Business Trade Association, ABTA, which is a sponsor here. And in there we have a small business association, and TJ runs a AMTC for us. We have 2,500 or so small businesses, and our SMEs, so many of them are going to be fine. You know, trade war, no trade war, they're going to be fine because they're small enough that nobody much cares, <laughs> which is, you know, I mean, a bit sad for small because you want them to grow big. But they can navigate through lots of things. There are rules that are going to be complicated, but many of them are so small that they're not going to get caught out by things like... You know, the Europeans have a super complicated rule called GDPR, which is about data privacy. That is really complicated, and if you actually follow it, it can be, and if you were really serious about it, can be very complicated and difficult. But most small companies are never going to actually follow the letter of the law because it's too difficult, especially here in Asia. But they're not going to be likely to get caught out, so they can do lots of little, this is the, the point you're making, they can maneuver around these kinds of things. So small companies can do a lot, with the ability because they are you know, able to find gaps and cracks and so forth. But it is difficult, and it gets a bit more difficult as the global structure, if, if the global structure fragments, because they're used to operating as the sort of multi, micro multinational where 
they can just, you know, sell things. They, they go on Alibaba or they turn on their own website and anyone anywhere can just buy their goods or services and it works out pretty seamlessly. But if payments don't work, that's a problem for them. So, you know, that you say this is a fantastic thing and I can maneuver around just about anything, but if you can't get paid <laughs> because you can't actually get the money from where it is, your customer, whoever it happens to be, to your account, it doesn't matter <laughs> how wonderful you are at maneuvering around things. If the payment doesn't land into your bank account, then your ability to maneuver and take advantage of opportunities doesn't work for you. So there are some real obstacles that do finally stop a small business from being fairly successful, and payments is one of them. Some of the data rules is going to be one of them, another one of them. So, you know, small is great, and it doesn't matter whether you're a developed or developing economy, you know, you can take advantage of lots of things you couldn't do before, but there are some hard obstacles to your ability to succeed. Um, and the more that we make rules difficult in especially payments, data, et cetera, the harder it is for small businesses to, to be able to succeed. Thank you. Thank you for those very emphatic and assertive <laughs> bottom lines. Yeah. I see some other hands raised, but I want to invoke my privilege as a chairman and ask Amit a question, <laughs> which is actually a different take on a point that uh, Dipinder raised earlier which is that there is a view, widely held view, that uh, Trump tariffs are uh, self-defeating, and that there are job losses in America, especially in the low-tech industries. That's real. But those job losses are not because of uh, uh, competition from China. Those job losses are because of technology. The technology has pushed America up the value chain, and a lot of jobs have been lost. So if in that context, Trump is imposing tariffs and protection, pursuing protectionist policies, it is going to hurt America. It's not going to create jobs. In fact, America might end up losing more jobs in downstream industries than it gains in upstream industries. And importantly, American consumers will be hurt because of higher prices. So Trump, during the campaign, said that I will win so many deals for America that Americans will get tired of winning. <laughs> on the contrary, he might be inflicting crushing pain on American consumers. What's your take on this? Uh, when do you think Americans will come to realize that the tariffs, protectionist policies are hurting them? And will, as uh, Deborah said, there is a lot of support for trade in America? When is that trade support for American support for trade in America going to manifest in democratic politics? Yeah, Amit. I think uh, from a very specific American perspective and context, Debbie will be in a better position to answer. But I'll argue this. Uh, when it comes to the entire narrative of uh, looking inward, trusting tariffs, protecting domestic industries, more jobs are concerned, I think that, that really doesn't come out of conviction. That is a political position, which really does not have much to do with economic conviction and logic, because I don't really think that President Trump, who is at the core of his heart a business person, he fully understands the virtue of cross-border trade and what he creates does. what. I'm quite sure he does. And it's not just he. Uh, I think that is, that is understood by many across the world. But when it comes to a political narrative, which is beginning from what Dipinder said, an anti-globalization narrative, it is important to don an anti-trade hat uh, for those people who feel short-changed and who have suffered. Uh, because of arguably a process of so. more and more free trade. Because I think, uh, you know, what, what Debbie said is right. I mean, it was never an assumption that free trade will benefit everybody or benefit everybody at all points in time in an equal fashion. So there is a cycle which the world has caught up with where the casualties from trade are appearing that much more. So I, I think it's, it's a clear political game of crafting an agenda which connects to certain constituencies. And there is, a, there is a benefit in that. But let me just also in this context elaborate on two points which I think are really uh, risky for the world at large if this is taken forward. I think what this trade war has 
brought to the table and made evident to everybody is that one, unilateral actions have got a sanction. Today, countries will not hesitate to act unilaterally. Uh, this began from the US. Retaliations have followed. Today, even India has retaliated. But India has not retaliated to the US withdrawing the GSP. India has retaliated to the US imposing steel and aluminum tariffs, which it had announced a year ago. And finally, that has come through. And there are other countries which are following through. My fear is that if this unilateral actions are considered you know, acceptable by countries across the world, then you actually might see them coming out in far more pervasive and creative forms. I'll just give a regional example. If today the European Union thinks that biofuels should not be considered a part of renewables, it means Malaysia and Indonesia think that, look, this is terrible for us. This is affecting our national security. Because today, national security is conditional on my economic prospects. And this is exactly the argument which Trump gives in Section 301, when he tries to stop import of automobiles. So then you start a new series of trade war. And now this gets to be fashioned between Southeast Asia and Europe. I think this is the real risk that we have now, that the US has actually set a precedent. And we were talking about the WTO and the Cold War. The WTO is a post-Cold War product. And had the Cold War been around, WTO probably would have never happened. But it's those rules of trade which are now being challenged, challenged viciously by institutionalizing unilateral action and the sanctity and support for it. And that might just catch on. That might catch on in large fashions in large parts of the world. And I think there are political takers for it. So countries might very well think, uh, you know, what I mean to say is that had it happened five years ago, countries might not have resorted to unilateral action. But today they might. That atmosphere and environment has been created. Thank you, Ahmed. You've been very wise and eloquent as usual. There are some things that you said that I don't agree with, but I won't raise them now. But I'll turn to Deborah to give an American perspective on this. <laughs> This is always a drag, frankly, <laughs> being an American with an American's perspective. Okay. Um, uh, yeah. So the protectionism. You know, do Americans uh, do they do they recognize the damage being done? I, I think that's why the tra support for trade is going up, because yes, people are starting to recognize it, and particularly as the tariffs into on products coming into the U.S. continue to go up. And especially, I think you will see it as this next batch of tariffs hits. They are now on consumer-facing products. So you've gone from 10% to 25% on $200 billion worth of goods into the US. And most of those are consumer-facing products. So when you, average shopper in the US, now go to buy shoes in the US, they go up from 10% 10, 10 to 25%. They may, actually, the 10% probably wasn't passed through, but the 25% is likely to be. So all of a sudden, shoes are 25% more, and shirts are 25% more, and backpacks are 25% more. And when you go to do back-to-school shopping for your kid, because in the US, school starts in August, September, notebooks are 25% more, and crayons are 25% more. And all of the back-to-school shopping is a lot more money I think people will start to go, wait a second, this now matters to me in a way that it may not have mattered to me before, because that is going to start to add up. And when you go to Christmas shopping in particular, and Christmas tree lights, which are only made in China, are suddenly going to be 25% more, that is going to go, wait a second, now that's crazy. Ornaments, lights, all the stuff that one needs for Christmas, toys, everything, all through the roof, wow, now I care a lot. And then when you combine that with the price that's going for jobs that are saved, we have studies now in the US that for every steel job saved in the US, it's costing $800,000 US. So that's more than a million sing per job saved per year. To save one steel worker's job, people are starting to say, well, this looks like a poor bargain. You know, Maybe we should try something different. So the support for tariffs is not high. And so whatever happens in the election, you know, if Trump choked on a pretzel this evening and died, I'm not certain that you would have the tariff policies continue. 
And I'm not certain that you would have the U.S. engaging in <coughs> trade conflicts with the universe. But I do think people should recognize that trade conflicts between the U.S. and China are likely to continue because there is a very strong and hostile action in Washington, especially for doing, doing something, in quotations, for, against China because of a whole range of opposition policies <coughs> by the U.S. to China. And increasingly, since India is on the table, India is also in the, the line of sight. So I think people yeah. should be braced for something much bigger, particularly now India has poked the bear <laughs> with its tariffs against U.S. products, um, probably not a very smart or wise thing, especially since they were just really, frankly, not worth doing tariffs against the U.S. It was 29 products or something. I mean, it was really, I would not have gone there because the U.S. has got a Section 301 lined up against India as it is, and now you have brought it, brought it forward. So I would say this was not a very smart or sensible idea, but I would expect that U.S. response to China would continue post-Trump because there is bipartisan support for that, and potentially something U.S.-India. Now, whether the mechanism is the same, I think, is, is different. I, I, I find it hard to imagine that Democrats would support tariffs as the policy tool, but they are also interested in doing something. And since there doesn't seem to be so many tools available to you, Trump has now cracked open a toolbox that we have not seen used in different ways, including just this week, I don't know if you all noticed, but he had cracked open a new one that I didn't even remember we had from 1962 or something called Section 332. I didn't even know we had such a thing, but Section 332 cracked open this week for a new policy. So there's just all kinds of like, let's figure out what have we got from the Cold War from 1962 that could be maneuvered in some way to go after someone. So it's, uh, it's unusual. These are unusual times. Thank you. Thank you for that American analysis, not an American view. Uh, but you know, a lot of people around the world uh, who don't have a vote in America uh, keep hoping that this backlash that you talked about backlash against uh, protectionist policies will catch on in time for the next election so that it has an influence in the election. I saw some other hands raised questions. Uh, yes. Hi, I'm really enjoying our European, just first setting up a talk for the last week. Uh, there's, there's a mic coming to you. Oh, can yeah. you please speak. Thanks. Yeah. 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 My name is Joy Rankodge. I'm in the process of setting up a corporate advisory firm. Um, I, I was going down the, 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 the line of question that you were you just started on w w what is the political I mean political calculus within countries of these tariffs hitting I mean is it is it immediate you think in, if you look back at history is the political cycle do we do, does the pop do the populations vote out and re-elect pro-trade politicians immediate or is there is there a you know, couple of cycles that, that happens? I guess that's question one, more from a political standpoint. And question number two, more business uh, strategy standpoint, during the Cold War, how were multinationals, like, how, how were their strategies, if you were to kind of look, look back in time to see in a bifurcated world, did, how were their strategies, if you were to kind of take a leaf from how did GE, for example, operate in a Cold War environment, if anybody's done any work on that? Thanks. Well, uh, first of all, we have never used tariffs like this, not since the 30s, right? So, I mean, it's hard to say what, what happens when you start throwing tariffs around. This is unusual. We don't know. And on the Cold War, it was very different because the U.S. and the Soviet economies were ba basically divorced. So you did not have, at the time, and you certainly didn't have as the Cold War developed, this sort of intertwining of economic connections that then had to be broken and then develop after that, which you now have very tight economic links at all levels, small, large companies, American, foreign, et cetera, that are at risk, at least at risk, could be happening, of detaching and then undoing that is very complicated. And so how that gets done, if that gets done and how that might get done is a question. And so we don't know. We, I mean, we just haven't had, this is all new. So that's, 
you know, this is exciting, I suppose, if you're studying it, so yay for think tanks and so forth, but it is complicated if you're companies. Amen. I think, uh, let, let me put it in this way, that uh, <coughs> when, we, when we look at protective actions, right, and I'm confining myself to tariffs, somebody like uh, President Trump, for example, or other countries, they are obviously working on a protective aid agenda, but they are not backing out of trade deals. They're continuing to negotiate. The promise is that we will deliver our people a deal which maximizes their economic interest. Nobody knows what that is. Because if you take an example and compare the NAFTA and the USMCA, which has been delivered now to the American people, uh, whether it's better than NAFTA or not requires very intensive debate. And debates on the sections where you belong to, which side of the spectrum you get to. So ultimately, tariffs have two roles to play. A, for a number of countries, it's now retaliatory unilateral action to signal that you are unhappy with a larger trade relationship. I agree with Debbie on the point that I don't see why India had to retaliate on 29 items of $240 million imports from the United States of America. Where was the need? Except for conveying the signal. Again, I'm not totally sure what signal it meant to convey. <laughs> but rewinding back to a year before when it started, I see that India was a group of 16 countries which joined hands together at WTO in resisting the steel and aluminum tariffs under Section 232. So whether it was solidarity or symbolic or something like that is different. I, I don't think it's intended to serve anything beyond that. But what I want to argue is that unilateral actions now as I mentioned, have become sanctified because the US has started taking this. What the US starts doing becomes, by default, a kind of law, a kind of standard across the world. So now, I won't be surprised if India takes this position as it has been that, look, I don't want to give in to a system where you continue with zero tariffs on electronic products because my right to tariff is being taken away. And I want that, and tariffs are good. The United States has shown that tariffs are good for it. So why can't it be good for us? You see, this is a very twisted, fabricated narrative that is now going to occupy the center stage in trade conversation. How one walks out of it is anybody's guess. But I think the actors who are really serious about avoiding this need to carve out a space which is beyond this unilateralism because if you look at the scenarios that uh, Kimberly pointed to, you know, when we look at something like technological disruption, right? Technological disruption is a situation of where technology has gone way ahead of uh, the state of regulations. And we unfortunately see unilateralism dominating that space because each country, each region is now in a position or at least offering to produce its own laws when it comes to management and governance of data, cybersecurity, so on and so forth. And it's unilateralism. Nobody is happy with any other system that is being proposed. So this is actually where uh, I, I, I'm afraid that I, I have to be a bit cynical in this respect, and I have to you know, uphold the view that I don't really see how there is a pushback possible from this unilateralism, which has been given a very strong momentum to go ahead. It's difficult to be non-cynical uh, in a scenario like this, but it's interesting that you recall that uh, Davos campaign of 16 countries, including India, against uh, protectionist tariffs. But I also recall that within less than two weeks after that, the finance minister in India imposed punishing tariffs, uh, contradicting what the campaign they ran in Davos. Rani, I saw your hand being raised several times in the past half an hour. I, I, I'm wondering whether the, the title of this panel was Trade War, and I'm wondering whether it would be more accurate to say we're seeing trade wars. There is the big US-China, but there is also the latest uh, retaliation counter-terrorist by, announced by India. 
the European Union, counter tariffs, uh, you know, the, the engagement with Canada, with, um, with Mexico, part of that resolved. But I'm wondering, as more countries start to announce counter tariffs or measures to stand up, whether that whether there might be a silver lining to that in that I mean I mean then do you kind of point to this to say, you know, it's going down a slippery slope if it's gotten, you know, the US stamp of approval to use tariffs, but but one could also say as more countries stand up like India and announce countervailing measures, does that not show the limits of engaging in this tariff war with different countries? I mean, it's one thing to take on Mexico. But, you know, if you have the European Union and China and India, this is going to start really having an impact on the U.S. And I'm wondering whether we're seeing, as countries do, and, and European Union and other uh, groups stand up, whether we might be able to see a silver lining uh, to these trade wars. I mean, to see the silver lining. <laughs> Show the silver lining. Un unfortunately, instead of silver, I see more of gray. <laughs> <laughs> Not the lines, I mean, more the clouds shaping. And, uh, look, I think, let, let me put it this way. There, there were some studies which were done in the wake of the tariffs that were imposed and the steel and aluminum tariffs particularly. I think the problem that arises is that we, we are probably looking at what happens to India, what happens to Brazil, what happens to Mexico. These are not small economies. They have the capacity to be resilient. They have fairly respective large segments of engagement with them. I think we are not looking at what's happening to much smaller economies. Now, irrespective of whether India had retaliated or not, the fact that the US had raised steel and aluminum tariffs meant much more harmful prospects for much smaller exporters of steel to the United States, who are now getting completely pushed out because they don't have any preferential access they did not had earlier. Now the tariffs are going to hurt into their business. And there are studies by the Peterson Institute which point to actually a group of 34 such economies, including exporting countries like Bangladesh, who are going to get pushed out of the entire spectrum of steel export to the US. I think whether India retaliates or not, and whether India does it symbolically, is a space that India still continues to enjoy. It can get away bad-mouthing you know, without really meaning something serious. Not many other countries have that space. I mean, many other countries might actually feel injured, affected, yet they cannot do anything about it because the only forum they could have gone to is the WTO. The WTO is powerless to do anything on this occasion because we have had this ruling in the Russian-Ukraine dispute recently, which, which very clearly mentions that countries can invoke national security. And the WTO really cannot stop that. They can take national security as a ground for imposing unilateral actions. WTO might just check into that, but it cannot stop that. So I guess we are moving into a very murky, dirty kind of affair when it comes to trade. And uh, whether countries realize the futility of such actions or not is frankly debatable, because I, I don't think they're pursuing economic logic in taking these actions. Amit is not able to see a silver lining. Can I turn to Kimberly to show the silver lining? Mm. Um, good question. Uh, so on the escalation of tariffs, I'm afraid I also don't see a silver lining. I, you may have a point, but I would say it would be a pyrrhic victory for precisely the reasons that Amitendu mentioned. Um, like with all wars, there's costs, and the costs are borne by probably the weakest, and at the end of the day, everyone loses some amount. Um, what I will say, or let me do a scenario, because there's been a lot of talk about trade war and everything that's going wrong. So I find myself sitting here thinking, you know, being a bit controversial. And actually, 
there's some stuff that's going right. So I'll just lay that out, maybe instead of a silver lining. Um, from Geneva, the fact that those countries did go to the WTO and that they are litigating at the WTO on the Section 232 tariffs, that's already something. Okay, So there's some investment in the WTO there. Um, the US is engaging <coughs> with the EU and Japan on their pet topic of SOEs and, and, and other issues. So there's some, some interesting cooperation going there. The US would love to see a negotiation opened up at the WTO on SOEs and subsidies. Um, should that move forward, they might not get much traction, but they would engage. Um, there is already engagement on e-commerce by 70 plus nations. They are, for all um, intents and purposes, negotiating. Um, there's also ongoing talks on investment facilitation. Um, there are talks on gender, um, how we can improve trade policy for women, on how we can improve trade policy for SMEs. So this is all going. Geneva is actually a very lively place, much so, so than it has been in previous years. Um, there's also a aim to conclude a deal on fishery subsidies by the end of this year with strong push there. That, I would say, is something that um, everyone who has an interest on trade should be pushing for because this is an opportunity for trade rules to actually do a really good thing. Um, for once, so indisputably, uh, we can help and make a contribution to an environmental factor. There are politics, there are... Um, certain um, con other considerations to be taken into account. There's the S&DT <coughs> issue to be navigated. But overall, on balance, harmful fishery subsidies need to be stopped, and the WTO is a mechanism to help us achieve that through a negotiated outcome, not through force. Um, there, at the regional level, EU Japan just did a deal. Uh, ASEAN's ongoing negotiations. Um, we have the CFTA in Africa. So there's a lot going on across the world. So I don't know if there's a silver lining, but I think what I'm trying to say is that you, countries that we're not just moving steadily into a trade war. There are things that countries can do to negotiate with their bilateral partners, and there are positive agendas even multilaterally still. There is, there's no silver lining. Maybe there's some silver box. Yes, uh, there is a lining. There is a lining. Yes, Go ahead. We, we actually, as it turns out, we actually, we just finished. <laughs> we just finished our hats. We've been talking about making them for a while, but we we made them on purpose because. The good news about making trade great again is that we have never had a conversation about trade in a way that we're having it now. So the good news about Trump and his policies is that for all the damage they're causing, and there is significant damage, he is making trade great again, because we are having these conversations in places all over the universe that we never had trade conversations before. And we're restarting <coughs> conversations in Geneva which has been more abundant forever, I mean forever. We're having conversations in APEC where things were really looking dire for a very long period of time. They are moving finally again on the RCEP side, so we might, fingers crossed, get a deal this year. I know we've had that promise before, but really we might get it done this year. So I think in general people are starting to say, well, wait a second, we've taken this trade thing for granted for so long, this is bad. Maybe we should take it seriously and actually do something about trade. And, and taxi drivers actually care about it in ways that they never did before. So, I mean, I, again, I'm not suggesting that we should have a trade war to make trade great again. This would not have been my solution to the problem. But having had one, I think the good news is that we are paying attention to it. In, and we're actually coming up with creative solutions to problems that no one wanted to address for the longest time. Yeah. So while it's been not, again, this is not my recommendation about how we should have started this conversation, but we're having these conversations. And I think that is a silver lining that yeah. we would never have had had we not had a different version of this hat moving around. Yes. Many silver linings, as you say. <laughs> One of them is that it gives business to think tanks like us. There you go. Uh, have symposiums and panel discussions. <laughs> Yes. Six dollars fifty cents. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's come out of the global value chain. Do you need any prices? From China. Okay. I wanted to join two concepts. We have no time to discuss about inventions and innovations. That are, I think, very important. Uh, one is the Mm. Thank you.
Uh, thank you for that comment. Uh, there's just one question that I want to raise, which has not come up before, mm. which is that in this game of chicken, perhaps America is underestimating China's strength. No, the American belief that this China is hurting, so eventually they'll give in and uh, uh, come to a truce. Perhaps that's a miscalculation. Mm. The Chinese version is that we have much more weaponry available to us than you believe. We can disrupt you, a point that Kimberly raised earlier, that America, China can dump US treasuries, cause hurt to the dollar, uh, even though uh, China's exports to US are four times uh, US uh, exports to China. China can hurt America. China is behaving responsibly because uh, it wants to be a responsible global citizen. So China is telling, telling America, don't underestimate our strength. What's your response to that? You're, you're looking at me, um, yes. so I'll answer. I look at everyone else. <laughs> yes. OK, so I think um, China is operating as a rational economic actor in, a, in the economic system it exists in. It needs, it, China faces the challenge of a shifting geopolitical system that it doesn't yet know quite how to act in. Um, so China rose as a result of integrating into the global economy and joining the WTO. We saw great takeoff of trade and investment flows, significantly contributed to poverty reduction. Um, so I think China doesn't want to see the rules-based system go away. However, there, there is a political conflict. And part of the challenge of trade negotiations is always navigating around politics, because economics and politics are not always, uh, don't always go well together. But that is the challenge that trade negotiators face. And I think this is a big one that the US and China face. And part of the challenge, particularly at the WTO, is giving China an elegant um, way to manage its politics, likewise for the US, while achieving um, the, that economic, or finding that economic uh, um, landing zone. And, and I would say on this a particular example is the fishery subsidies. So some of the biggest beneficiaries of, um, uh, of, of fishery subsidies in China are state-owned enterprises. So what we thought was just an environmental issue it is running straight headlong into one of the biggest, the, the, the big clash between these two economic systems. So hopefully trade negotiators will find a way to navigate that politics um, it's for the environmental and economic benefits. Thank you. Raymond, let me look at you uh, now to reflect on that question about uh, whether America is uh, underestimating China's strength. Mm -hmm. From a GVC perspective, do you have a response to that? Well, underestimating China's strength indeed. Um, the shifting geopolitical system that is taking place, China mm -hmm. is looking to fill that gap. So looking to fill that gap by pretending or acting as a responsible global citizen is perhaps what it's doing. If you look at the BRI, for example, um, the, 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 the school, two schools of thought, right? Um, but I'm in the, the frame of mind that BRI is China's opportunity to develop its economic capability to grow. So. Yes, the shifting geopolitical system, um, China acting as a responsible global citizen, yes. But I think the key word here is acting. It will act in its own best interest. It's looking at filling that gap that is being left or that, that vacuum that exists because of US policies and politics. Um, but it's an act. It's acting in its own best interest. Thank you. Deborah, your closing statement? on that or anything else that you want to say about uh, China, US, the world? Well, I think that the difficulty is that I think neither side quite understands the other, but particularly it's a problem, I think, in Washington, where among the, for trade, okay, let me just be clear about trade. On the trade side, we have, uh, it's being run by a very small number of people who do not really understand China, don't have China experience, discredit experts who know China. And so that's leading us into a really, you know, a, a dead end because 
the, the assumption is that China is weak and will fall instantly to more U.S. pressure. So the U.S. Just says, well, all we need to do is keep upping the pressure and China will fall, and I think this is a mistake. And so the Chinese tend to have the mirror of that. So the argument is U U.S. is weak. They will fall if we continue to respond with more pressure. And yet what you end up with, of course, is the worst outcome of all, where each side just keeps ratcheting up the pressure and the net result is what no one wanted, but we end up with both sides backed into a corner escalating pressure, and no one, either the U.S., the Chinese, and everyone else, ends up with the worst outcome of all. Amit, finally, to you. Uh, to me, I think I, I still would uh, hold on to the position that trade has a lot to deliver. When it comes to prospects of people and countries and regions, trade has a lot to deliver. Uh, the way the trade war is proceeding, the way it is likely to persist in the future is very, very unfortunate. But I think the biggest uh, element that is lacking in this entire atmosphere is trust. Uh, countries have probably run out of whatever trust they had of each other when it comes to trade conversations. And that is why even the simplest of movements on trade are looking very, very difficult to achieve. So unless that trust is recovered, I am afraid that trade is going to remain <coughs> stuck in, in the quagmire that we see. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for those uh, closing comments. And before we wind up the discussion, I want to take up another poll, taking off from what you said, use the word trust. If and when Trump departs the global scene and the political scene, how many of you think that the world will revert to some trust, some pre-Trump world of trade? Or do you believe that Trump has left such a lasting impact on the world that we'll never come back to that state? Trump. You believe that we will come back to some normalcy? How many believe that we'll come back to some normalcy? Oh, very few hands, and those are very hesitant hands. So Trump is going to have a lasting impact on, on the world of trade. And have been able to convince the people. Uh -huh. Well. Uh, becoming cynics. <laughs> uh, on that note, I want to thank the panelists for a very stimulating discussion. They've uh, responded to a very wide range of questions. And uh, all of us are perhaps more cynical, but certainly more informed. Thank you very much. Thank Let's you. give up. Thank you.